Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio. Do me a favor, will you? Do me a favor. Pause this video in just one second. Write down on a piece of paper, on a tablet, on a computer, I don't care where, on your cell phone, leave a voice note and say, here's what I was doing January the 29th, 2017. Trust me, it's important. I'll wait. All right. Thank you very much for doing that. Now, let me tell you why I said to do that, because today is the day that the greatest problem facing the world, the modern world, maybe even the world of all time, the greatest problem has started to be solved today, January 29th, 2017. <sighs> it's a beautiful thing. Now, what did I say in 2015? Oh, yes, I was roundly mocked for it by many. Ah, that's fine. <laughs> Mockery. Um, is, uh, uh, is is natural, you know, it, it, it's sort of like when you keep chickens, you sort of walk through them and they make noise. But um, what did I say in 2015? I said, Donald Trump is a god of competence. Now, how did I know that? Well, <laughs> takes one to know one. I'm a competent person uh, too. I built this show from nothing, from nothing, from talking in my car <laughs> to where it is right now, the biggest philosophy show in the world ever seen. And, uh, you know, coming up to 300 million views and downloads, uh, influence in the very highest corridors of power around the world, amazing world-changing conversations, ideas, and arguments and presentations. So, yeah, it's not that hard for me to see Donald Trump's competence because I'm a competent person <laughs> myself. See, if you can't see his competence, and maybe there are people in your life that, Donald Trump's an idiot, he's a buffoon, he's a clown. See, if you can't see his competence... There might be a reason for that, and that reason might not be that he's incompetent. Listen, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, if you can't see someone's competence because you're not competent, nothing to be ashamed of. It doesn't have to stay that way. You kind of just have to be quiet, you know, observe and learn something. It's actually called the Dunning-Kruger effect, that incompetent people cannot judge competence. So this is just an important thing to remember, and... Uh, it's a, pr it's a pretty good way of figuring out who's confident and original in the world, just looking at how they react to Donald Trump. So what's going on? Well, this weekend, what did the mainstream media do? Well, they, they got up, they brushed their teeth, they scratched themselves a little, and then they sat down to do that voodoo that they do so well. Uh, and um, lie, 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 lie. That's their gig. That's their beat, so to speak. So they lied about President Donald Trump instituting a Muslim ban, wasn't a Muslim ban, lied about the contents of the executive order, lied about those impacted by these new guidelines, and lied about why these specific seven countries were included in the travel restrictions because they were marked as areas of concern by Barack Obama's administration, but apparently it's really bad when Donald Trump does it. Donald Trump was painted as a monster for placing a temporary ban on accepting Syrian refugees, while... Other world leaders bent over backwards, bent themselves into amoral, goo-based, postmodern pretzels to virtue signal and express their willingness to potentially destabilize their own countries to get a cheap little one-up on Donald Trump. Justin Castro, sorry, uh, Justin Trudeau for, for one. Because here's the thing, you know, this is just, you know, a little tip for Justin Trudeau. I know it can be tough to go from snowboard instructor to... Canadian Prime Minister, but, you know, you you could be on the phone solving world problems the way that Donald Trump is, which I'll get to in a second. You could be on the phone. You know, instead of just saying, we'll take the refugees, nah, 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 we'll take the ones you won't. I mean, I mean, I know this might cut into your time kicking soccer balls in gay pride parades or arranging awkward three-way weird squid-like handshakes between yourself and the president of Mexico and Barack Obama. But, you know, you could get on the phone and try and solve these problems. Pick up the phone, you know, like Trump does. Because here's the thing. We've got this refugee crisis and people from the Middle East are pouring into the West. And it's not uh, working. It's not working. We've got no-go zones. Uh, in Sweden has become the rape capital of the world. Uh, the number of people who are employed coming in uh, in these refugee programs, I mean, it's completely catastrophic. Completely catastrophic. And you see, you don't want to use these refugees as props for your own virtue signaling, right? See, they're not props. They're not sitting around to make you look good and make you look kind and have you paint your little welcome refugee hearts on your banners. They're not props, people. 
They're human beings. They deserve a right to have a successful life, which generally they're not going to have in the West. This is not me just making things up. In Sweden, the state-funded broadcaster revealed that out of 163,000 migrants who came to Sweden, fewer than 500 have found jobs. 500, that's a very tiny number. After years of hundreds of thousands of refugees pouring into Germany, how many have found jobs? A little over 50, most of those employed by the post office. Look at the gender ratio between the men and women. Um, way, way out of balance. I mean, even in the population as a whole, but within the migrant community, it's, uh, well, it's kind of an end-to-end bratwurst sausage fest. Um, and that's a, well, dare I say, a, uh, an explosive situation. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. Um, the migrants, the young men, they come in, or the refugees, or they come into Europe and the government puts them up or keeps them around, or gives them money, And then what? What do they do? They can't get jobs. They don't speak the language. Two-thirds of the Syrians coming into Germany, illiterate in their own language. Not going to work. Not going to work. It's not going to work. They're not props for you to feel good, and they're not props for you to get voters to vote for the left. If you really care about these refugees, don't invite them in where they can't work, they can't have jobs, they can't have successful communities, they can't... um, Most importantly, they can't settle down and have wives and children, right? That's how you tame young men. That's how you lower their testosterone as you get them married and get them to knock someone up. And boop, 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 down it goes the staircase of rather aggressive to, well, maybe, I guess guys in Europe may have gone just a little bit too far to the other extreme and, you know, flopping around. But a red pill, no, it's actually a blue pill there that they need. But, um... It's not, it's not helpful. They're not props. Uh, and we want to do what we can to help the people displaced by war. And we want to do what we can to the countries that could improve if there are energetic people who want to make that country better. And if the most energetic people and intelligent people are fleeing a country, guess who's left behind? No one to make things better. It's terrible. Those who want to actually help refugees, those displaced by war uh, and so on, and instability... We know, we know, and I've been saying this for a long time, that the cost of resettling, for the cost of resettling 10,000 people in the United States, you can settle almost 122,000 in the Middle East. So if you really want to help people, you understand, if you really want to help people, having them come and, and, and come off the plane and give you hugs, that's for you. It's not for them. It's not going to help them in the long run. It's going to cause a lot of problems because we know they're going to come in, they're going to go on welfare, they're going to chew up and and consume scarce public resources, social resources. They're going to require crazy amounts of educational investments because of language problems. They're going to bring diseases, not their fault, it's just the reality, for which the local population is under-inoculated and unprepared. It's, It's a bad situation. You couldn't design something more prone to make everything worse than this massive relocation. So you can either help 10,000 people by having them come to the United States where, uh, let's see, different language, different culture, different religion, different climate, different social structure, different law system, different... Not going to work. And it just didn't take that much to figure this out. How long would it take for you to adapt to life in Saudi Arabia or Yemen? It's not that hard to figure out. How long would it take for you to feel completely acclimatized and at home and perfectly comfortable in Iran? A little while. See what I'm saying? It's not helping them. It's not helping them. You can resettle 121,797 people in the Middle East for every 10,000 you bring here. Bringing them to the West is not a solution. It's actually going to make everything worse. Refugees far more likely to succeed in the Middle East. Uh, and um, that's what needs to be done. So it's bad for the refugees to come to the West. It's bad for the host countries overall. And um, I know I know what the gig is. Like, I kind of understand the deal, right? This is, uh, I've done the history of Rome, which you should check out. Uh, it's important. Um, this is the way it works. Um, women get the vote, and you get massive uh, giant social programs set up. 
leftists come in and convince women that they really should have these giant social programs, but but there's too many people in the world, so don't have babies. Zero population growth. Too many of us. And this is how you destroy um, the economy, right? Because there's, well, the women grow up, get old, retire, and they need a lot of health care, and they need a lot of old age pensions, but there's no young people to, to pay for these things because they didn't have children. <laughs> Big giant social programs, no children to pay for them. Good job. Good job. Way to fight that stereotype that ladies ain't so great with the math. So um, what happens is then is that normally what would happen is there'd be a big giant war or something to, to cover up the fact that the government's about to run out of money. This is what generally happens. Now, that's not going to happen now because there's like nuclear weapons in the West and so on. You can't have another third world war in the West at least. So, um, so massive destabilization events occur so that uh, when the government runs out of money, uh, people are too busy fighting each other and resenting each other to um, get mad at the government uh, for, and the feminists and the Marxists and all that garbage that has accumulated over the past 60 years in the West, or longer, really, in the case of Marxism. So I get it. I mean, but this isn't going to work. I mean, there's the internet now. People can find out the facts. Now, here's another thing. The, the, the Middle East, the Middle Eastern countries, have done precious little to step up and help solve the problem. And the reason they have not done much to step up and solve the problem is because Europe and the West have been taking in the migrants and the economic refugees and the people who just want a better life and the people who want to get on welfare and the people who have watched a lot of porn and think that all white girls are easy. I don't know. I mean, because they've all been leaving and coming to the West and the Western governments have picked up the tab, the Middle Eastern governments haven't had to do anything. Of course. I mean, if I have a neighbor who loves mowing lawns and I don't have a lawnmower and he mows my lawn every week, says, I love it, I love doing it, it's relaxing for me, it's great. Guess what? I'm not going to buy a lawnmower. If he decides to stop mowing my lawn, I don't have a riot. I don't sue him. What I do is I say, oh, I guess I got to get me a lawnmower. And I'm, mm, mm, right? It's not that complicated. If the West stops taking in all of the refugees, the Middle Eastern countries will step up to solve the problem. You know, visa suspensions and, and controlling this kind of migration, at least for these seven countries, suspending Syrian refugee program and so on, they get it. They get it. It's like, oh, well, they're not going to the West anymore. I guess we're going to have to deal with them locally. It's not that complicated. And so this problem is on the verge of being solved. Now, it's not final. It's, you know, it's... You know what they say, it's too good to be true, too good to be true, and so on, right? But um, this is the reality. So throughout his whole campaign, Donald Trump repeatedly talked about establishing these safe zones in the Middle East to aid refugees who were displaced to violence and instability and so on. He also said, you know, like much like he did with the wall in the Mexican government, that the Gulf states should cover the cost of these safe zones, not the United States. So remember I said, write down what you were doing Sunday? January 29th, 2017, this is why. On Sunday, King Salman of Saudi Arabia agreed to support refugee safe zones within both Syria and Yemen. Now, does this mean financially as well? Well, that's Trump's plan, and I wouldn't put it past him. Um, so that remains to be seen. Exactly what the word support means. But the White House has said the president requested and the king agreed to support safe zones in Syria and Yemen, as well as supporting other ideas to help the many refugees who are displaced by the ongoing conflicts. And that is really uh, an astounding, astounding step forward in this problem. Now, this has been available for years. You know, I mean, maybe nobody asked. I don't know. This has been available for years, and um, I guess Barack Obama, while, while it's true, he did work on his golf swing and his tan, just never got, got round quite to making a phone call and saying, hey, why don't you house these people locally rather than sending them halfway across the world to a culture and a country and a language and a religion that they have very little compatibility with? Now... Why? Well, Saudi Arabia is getting on board, possibly because they need help against Iran. Um, maybe Donald Trump uh, will release some of the 9-11 report that may have some interesting things to say about Saudi Arabia. 
The Saudi Arabian uh, heads of Saudi Arabia probably don't want Saudi Arabia on the list of countries who support terrorism. Uh, although um, some of Hillary's email leaks, uh, Hillary Clinton's email leaks, showed that she knew that the Sauds funded uh, ISIS. Now, I don't think that Hillary Clinton, who basically whose campaign was bought and paid for largely by the House of Saud, would be really good at pushing back and making the Sauds get in line. Uh, so this is uh, all very, very important. So, of course, Trump's been played to this heartless monster and... Now what's happening? Now that there's this un unbelievable, incredible, momentous step forward in the solution of this civilization-threatening problem of mixing these highly varied cultures, um, which may happen to some degree in a state of freedom, but isn't going to happen when Western governments are already vastly in debt, vastly in deficits, vastly overextended, vastly indebted. And, um, you know, when Sweden is spending... 13 times their entire defense budget just on one year of the migrant problem. And no, no, not sustainable, not sustainable at all. So if there's not celebration from the media, does the media actually want this migrant problem to be solved? Because here's the thing. <laughs> it's so important to get this. Here's the thing. If there are safe zones in Syria and Yemen, then there will be no refugees. Why? Because the refugees can go to the safe zones. What that means is that Europe doesn't have to take any refugees. Now, why is this important right now? Well, it's important right now because the refugee flood is not quite as big because it's winter. Come spring, there are millions and millions upon re of refugees who may want to make their way to Europe. We already know there are millions inside Turkey, and Turkey has a lot of leverage over the EU right now because basically they're holding back this tide of migrants like some sort of bioweapon and saying, do what I want, give us free passage into Europe, or we release the migrants. Well, if they're so great to have in your country, why are they being used as a weapon? Just a fundamental question that's important to ask. So this de-escalates, deleverages Turkey and its capacity to influence Europe. Because if there are safe zones, you don't need to flee. If you don't need to flee, you don't need to go to Europe, therefore Europe can turn you back. And that's, that's good, right? They can be helped locally. There are peace accords going on finally. So this is a massive step forward. We've got safe zones. We've got uh, peace uh, initiatives uh, breaking out. And this is going to take vastly the pressure off the passage to Europe because Europe can now say, no, 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 you've got safe zones. You don't need to come to Europe. And maybe, <laughs> just maybe, the refugees can start to go back to their country. See, that's how it's supposed to work. I'm no lawyer. This is my understanding. This is how it's supposed to work. You come for asylum, but if the war ends, you go back. If there's a safe place to go, you go back. If you can go back to your area without being persecuted or blown up or tortured or destroyed, or <gasps> you have a place to go. <gasps> well, isn't that interesting? Do you see why I said right down where you were today? This is the day the world may not end. Hmm. Not done. Trump, see, <laughs> I don't know what you did with your Sunday, but I think Trump pretty much had us both beat when it came to getting important stuff done. He wasn't done. He spoke with Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nahyan and, and, quote, raised the idea of supporting safe zones for the refugees displaced by the conflict in the region, and the Crown Prince agreed to support the initiative. So there you go, my friends. Two phone calls. Donald Trump received support for safe zones from Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi. Now, Trump has also been establishing a very strong relationship with Egyptian President Fatah Abdel el-Sisi. So... One week into his presidency, Donald Trump has identified and negotiated what could be a long-term solution for the entire migrant crisis, something which helps the displaced refugees in the best way conceivable for them to succeed. Not just this virtue signaling and pathological altruism and welcome refugees, but actually solving the problem. I mean, all these protesters are freaking out about Trump putting a hold on Syrian refugees. How do they look now that Trump appears to have negotiated a solution to help all of them at the source? <sighs> the
this is what he did with his Sunday. It's conceivable. It's possible. It's potential. That Donald Trump just saved Europe and Western civilization with two phone calls. Which only begs the question, what the hell were Obama and the other Western leaders doing all this time? Come on, people. It's a phone call. Now, who knows what kind of leverage Donald Trump used to get these agreements. Um, but, you know, I think it's fairly safe Saudi Arabia doesn't want to end up in a travel ban list or a terrorism watch list or anything like that. Of course, Trump's push for U.S. energy independence, which I remember from a kid being talked about from Ford and Carter and, oh, America must become energy independent. So he's got the Keystone Pipeline back from the dead. He's pro-coal and um, so he's going to open up lands for drilling and so on. So if America, and of course there was a big oil deposit recently found uh, in America, so if America becomes more self-sufficient in oil, then um, less susceptible to foreign control and manipulation due to oil production. I, I don't know what leverage Donald Trump used. Maybe just massive amounts of charisma. I have no idea. And what did it cost him? Two phone calls. It might even have been Skype or VoIP. Saving Western civilization, yes. One week ahead of schedule and under budget. I think that's kind of a win-win. Now, I want you to enjoy this. Enjoy this. I, for one, worked very hard to bring this about. <laughs> enjoy this, please. If you value what I do, please, please help me out. Freedomainradio.com slash donate. Very, very important. Voluntary free market. Don't be a free rider. Participate and help us out at freedomainradio.com slash donate. But here's what I want to do. Tell this news to your friends. Tell this news to those in your life. And, and see. Watch what they do. Watch what they're like when you tell them this potentially best news outside of the potential second coming. I don't know. It's, it's incredible stuff. Tell them and see how they react. Because anyone who is not popping champagne overjoyed at the prospect of this solution to the potentially world-ending crisis, the civilization-clashing crisis, anyone who's not overjoyed at the prospect of this solution has revealed themselves to you and to the world as clearly as they possibly could have. 